Hello, hello. Welcome to TV Skywriter. I'm Pat Murray, your host. On TV Skywriter, I talk to creative people, musicians, authors, whoever wants to come on the show who has something really good to say. Now, today we've got a real special guest, Douglas Ewart. Well, we go back, oh boy, since, let's see, you're, you're living in Minnesota. We're both, well, I'm from Chicago. You lived in Chicago for many years, right? Yeah. Yes. And Douglas Ewart is a musician, composer, educator, artist, everything. And let me just just say a couple things, if you don't mind. I have my little list here. Um, you play the sopranino and alto saxophones, clarinets, bassoon, flutes, bamboo flutes, even the Australian didgeridoo, which is pretty yeah. wild. Yeah. And um, member of AACM. If you're a jazz fan, you know that stands for the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians. Let's just casually throw some names around you who you've worked with. Joseph Jarman, Roscoe Mitchell, Art Ensemble of Chicago, Rufus Reed, Henry Threadgill, who are Richard Abrams, and now you're living in uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis, right? That's correct. You Been have, here for quite a few years now. Yeah. But I know people have already detected your accent. You're from Kingston, Jamaica, right? That's correct. I was born in Kingston and migrated to Chicago in 1963. Okay. Did you arrive here as a musician, or was that something that you developed? Because you were just a teen when you, when I, you moved to Chicago. I, I, was, I hadn't had any formal training. I certainly was interested in playing, and um, I began playing hand drums by converting various types of tin cans into drums. I never had a drum of my own or an instrument until I came to the United States. But I was inspired by watching Count Ozzy and the Mystic Revelation of Rastafari. They lived not far from where I um, grew up, and so I'd go there um, on Saturdays. <laughs> My grandmother was a Seventh-day Adventist, and so um, we'd go to church on Sunday, Saturday, rather, and I would um, attend church and then skip out and go up to Count Ozzy to listen to, to them play and, and reason, as we say. They would have these gatherings called groundations, in which uh -huh. you would have music, great discourse, and sometimes food. Awesome. When you say discourse, what you talked about the news of the day, or what? It's a, yeah, the news of the day. A lot of a lot of politics were discussed at the time. Um, there was a lot going on in Africa in terms of um, independent states, uh, the clamor for a united Africa. Uh, so you know, NASA speaking about NASA Sukuturi. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah, Hale Selassie, and so on. Tom Mboya, Patrice Lumumba. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot, and you know, there was a lot of changes happening in in the Caribbean and in Latin America, and certainly, you know, Fidel Castro um, mm -hmm. had not long come to power, so there was a lot of discussion about that. I bet there was a lot to talk about. Oh, absolutely. And oh. then the conditions in Jamaica, you know, what was taking place there politically, socially. Um, we were still under, we were still British subjects, if you will. Mm -hmm. And um, we were also clamoring for our independence. So there was a lot of, lot going on in Jamaica. The, the rise of, of uh, the independent record producers in Jamaica, Jamaican music outside of the the normal folk music, the, the rise of ska mm -hmm. and, um, and rock steady and reggae, those things were on the move. So, uh, and we were we were moving towards independence. So it was a powerful time. I, I grew up listening to a lot of ska and calypso. I know calypso is not Jamaican, but but I did grow up hearing a lot of that and reggae as well. And I was always surprised by how so much music came from one island and how you were able to get the music to the United States for those of us to, you know, who like that sort of music to hear. That was well, you know, we, 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 you know, you know, Calypso is uh, 
in a, is a Trinidadian yeah. uh, development. But we mm -hmm. have a form of music that's very close. Uh, it's different rhythmically and so on, and some of the the topics are different, but some of the topics are the same. Uh, it's called mento, which is... Oh, okay. I've heard that word. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. we have a form of music that sometimes is confused for Calypso. But mm -hmm. uh, so we have that indigenous music, and we have many other forms, you know. We have Kumina, we have uh, Buru, uh, we have Ilku, yeah. we have Brokins, then, you know, quadrilles, which are, you know, European dance forms, but we definitely Africanized uh, a lot of what takes place in it now. The maypole dance, uh, you know, well, Jamaica had a, has a, uh, a large population that have been derived from uh, Scots and Irish in terms of Europeans and uh, and then of course you know predominantly at least noticeable is um, are the people that are descended from Africans but we also have a legacy of indentured servitude with people coming from China and a larger number coming from India mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so Jamaica is pretty mixed and then we have um, mid people from the Middle East uh, so it's quite an amalgam. Yeah, you know, our slogan um, is out of many one people. Oh, okay. We're still working on it, though. Mm -hmm. Many quite yeah. one people, yeah. So you moved to Chicago, and did you immediately get into to, um, AACM and, and jazz? Or well, I've been listening to, to um, you know, I've been listening to a lot of music back home. Um, I had a cousin who had an enormous uh, collection, and so I was exposed to, you know, Ella Fitzgerald, uh, Charles Parker, Charlie, Charles Mingus, Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong. In fact, when I was a kid, Louis Armstrong came to Jamaica, and I remember my mom taking me to see him. Um, so I was, you know, I was exposed. And at that time, radio in Jamaica, um, very diverse programs. Uh, basically, we had two stations. If you didn't have shortwave, people that had shortwave, like my dad had shortwave, so you could pick up um, stations from the U.S. on on those clear evenings. You could pick up things from from Miami quite well. So, uh, yeah. and but radio in general was uh, very eclectic in terms of what was played. So we were exposed to a lot of uh, forms of music, including country and western. Really? People wow. were surprised. Yeah, people like Patty Page and and, um, and uh, Price and, you know, the, the big names of the time. Um, you know, because radio, radio um, recording companies at that time and the way they distributed music they were able to push artists on a global level in a different way than 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 is done now. I mean, no, of course, there is a you have greater access in some respects, but not the kind of power that those recording companies had to to play you, sure. you know, so many times a day over a week, or you know, they can make it. <laughs> I'm going to ask a question that might seem a little childish, but growing up on an island, see, I grew up in Chicago, and I've only seen Jamaica on TV, and growing up on an island like Jamaica Deep, is there a sense of isolation? I mean, you just told us you were able to listen to different types of music over the radio, over the airwaves. Yeah, absolutely but, not. But as, there's, there's no as feeling a of child, isolation? As a young person growing up or anything like that, I never felt any kind of isolation. I mean, it, that was your world. Um, I mean, and you weren't confined to that. Uh, I grew up on the waterfront, for one thing, and I guess one's imagination um, goes, you know, it's very active. You see a lot of ships coming and going. My, in my family, I have a lot of maritime people, 
people that have gone out on ships mm -hmm. um, or friends of mine. That's one way that many people were able to leave the island by working on a ship and then maybe um, going to some country and and never coming, going back on ship and eventually getting their papers. That was, you know, that was the way that some people were able to to get off the island. But in terms of thinking about the world or seeing the world. Um, I never felt confined in the, on the island. Maybe if I had stayed there until I was older, I might have had that feeling. But everything was there that you could possibly imagine that you needed to, wow. to thrive, to survive, and to thrive as a as a child. It was fabulous, um, really? especially the way we grew up. Because uh, my grand, we grew up in our grandmother's, my ma maternal grandmother's home. Uh, we were about an eighth of a mile from the Caribbean Sea. Uh, we never had to cross the street. To we our back gate opened into almost a hundred acres of open land. Um, wow, that's hard to imagine. You know, wow. Yeah, and and that's in Kingston, and it and then it goes down to the seaside. So we flew kites. We and there were different fields there. You know, lawn tennis. People played baseball over there, cricket fields, soccer. It was the scout headquarters called Duncaster. And um, so for, for us as children, you know, it was heaven on earth. Uh, wow. It's almost yeah, hard it, for me to understand why you'd want to leave. Well, economic circumstances are is one of the prevailing aspects of people having to leave um, sure. the island, you know, because... You only can. You only have a certain amount of em employment that's available to you, and if you want to, you know, I mean, places, islands like Jamaica, after certain industries uh, peaked, um, you know, opportunity for employment is a, is a difficult situation. So many many people migrated in order to to find adequate work. And resources and better than their positions. So yeah. Well, I uh, bet you didn't have a hundred acres when you moved to Chicago, right? <laughs> not near, not near it. You know, um, you know, you. I came. You lived in an apartment, which was a really different kind of world because we grew up in a world of cottages, and you know, no high-rise homes, none of that. You know, even even high-rises there were. You know, just a few stories, wow. so, and you know the kind of congestion that one faced when they went to Chicago. There was nothing like that in Jamaica. A lot smaller roads, um, a lot less intense. You know, when you you can throw, you can practically throw Jamaica in Chicago. <laughs> wow. Did it take a, Did it take you a while to get into music or or? Was, no, well, I, I was tell, as I was telling you, I had a cousin that had a large election, I mean, selection of um, recordings, and so I was exposed to a lot of the people that that piqued my interest in, in, in terms of music, Duke Ellington, mm -hmm. Charles Parker, and so on, and, and Coltrane, and, and uh, Billie Holiday, and, so, and I read all the liner notes, so I was pretty on it and I was in search of of of, um, of creativity even maybe I didn't know that's what I was seeking exactly and then um, in high school I tried to get into the band I went to Dunbar High School All right. and every time I'd go because I thought I wanted to be a trumpet player that was my my dream at the time and I um, every time I'd go, they it, they'd say they didn't have any more instruments. So I eventually didn't even bother with that. And upon graduation from high school, I bought a uh, uh, saxophone, an uh, alto saxophone. Ironically or serendipitously, it was Joseph Jarman's old Boucher alto saxophone. Wow, he started and out I, there. Yeah, and I Ooh. began. Um, you know, teaching myself how to play, and eventually I joined the AACM, the Association for the Advancement 
of creative musicians ran a free tra training program uh, that started formally. They were doing informal things. But they started their formal school in October of 1967. And I, I do I remember they had like a, uh, like a beginner uh, classes for, for kids. Yeah, well, kids, you could right? you could study you could study any you could study. Uh, when I went, you know, we studied composition, uh, instrument technique, and you know, ensemble. Which basically the ensemble was our own formulation, and uh, because we were studying composition, we were writing pieces and 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 realizing them by forming our own little ensembles, and eventually. That those ensembles that we formed with some of our peers at the schools, we we played at coffee shops and churches and that kind of thing. It was a great way to develop. What what neighborhood was the AACM based in back then? Um, it was. We were the first place that the school was held was at the old Lincoln Center, which is on uh, 700 East Oakwood Boulevard. It's between Cottage Grove and oh Mountain yeah okay Drive. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. now part of Northeastern mm -hmm. University. Mm -hmm. It's called right. the Jacob J Jacob Crothers Center. Okay. Yeah. I think it's one time part, it was it's called part the Center. Of it's part of Northeastern University. I remember some years ago. I think it was called the Center for Inner City Studies or something. That's like what that. it's. That's what yeah. Jacob Crothers mm -hmm. Center mm -hmm. for. You. Uh, for inner city studies, that's what it is. So, who were your teachers? Um, I studied composition with with Muhal, with with first before with Muhal with Anthony Braxton. Ooh. He was teaching at the school. He was also giving alto lessons. Roscoe Mitchell, I, but I, we studied theory with Braxton, alto with with Roscoe and Joseph. Um, and, you know, people that were also teaching at the school at the time were Malachi Favors on bass, um, and then Muhal was, was teaching more advanced theory, um, Lester Bowie was teaching trumpet, Leroy Jenkins, violin and viola, um. It must have been intense. I mean, those are top-notch, impressive musicians. That it was a great. Was it hard school. to keep up with them? It was a great school. I'm sorry. Was it hard to keep up with them? I mean, it's so intense. We were we we were we were so gung ho as students. No, nothing stopped. We never canceled a school meeting. I remember us meeting whether it was 20 or 40 below. None none of those things stopped the the school from happening. It was you know total yeah. dedication both on the part of the teachers and of the students. So everyone was enthusiastic about doing it. Wow. So when did you get to the point where you knew, really knew, that music was what you wanted to do? Wow. Um, by, I would say by about 68, after starting in 67, by 68 I was pretty Sure. I had studied tailoring at Dunbar, and I was working as a professional tailor, and um, and then I, you know, I had gotten into the saxophone, and I decided that's what I wanted to do. You know, uh, I tried teaching myself trumpet, and when I couldn't get it, you know, I didn't realize I, yeah, I probably would have done okay with it had I gone to somebody that played trumpet. And I did. There was a brother named Eba that played with Sun Ra. He's a great yeah. trumpeter. Wow. And he, he kind of told me, you know, that I needed to just be more patient. But, you know, I felt like, oh, I'm not getting you it. You were young. You didn't have any patience. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, you know, anyway, um, I, I don't have any regrets about having decided on reeds instead of brass. <laughs> Oh, your music's so beautiful. Um, actually, I have um, a couple of CDs here. These are I got these before moving here to North Carolina. 
Yeah. So, my two so bamboo, short CDs. Bamboo med Meditations at Band um, is a recording in which I utilize many instruments that I built uh, on that one. Um, it's very relaxed. It was done in Banff, uh, Canada, which is a great place, um, uh, an artist retreat. It's one of the state of the arts place developed and sustained by the Canadian government. It's exemplary. Uh, it's something that should be built in the United States. Something similar should be built here. We have nothing like that here. Maybe not enough. People have seen it, and maybe they don't realize what what's possible. You think? Um, listen, it's a place that you know it houses uh, ceramics, a recording studio. At the time, I had access to a 24-track recording studio. Of course, now with digital things, you can have you know almost endless. Um, they had people that were painters, drama on and on and on and all of you are there working uh, in residence it's a great uh, community and then is they have like a, is it like a summer camp kind of thing or it, for adults? Or I think it goes on I, I don't want to speak out of turn but I think it goes on all year hmm. you maybe know, somebody but, should do that here but I, uh, I had a, a um, I had a fellowship for about a 12-week fellowship there. I was only able to do six at the time, but incredible. And so that's where I made Bamboo Meditations of Band. The other one, Angles of Entrance, is, um, is a clarinet choir with a wonderful array of clarinetists, um, you know, Henry Treadgill, Moata Bowden, Edward Wilkerson, uh, J.D. Perrin, uh, Roscoe Mitchell, uh, Anthony Braxton, and myself, and Malachi Favors on bass. So it's Incredible. a, it's a wow. great, 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 yeah. great, great um, was one of those rare kind of gatherings. So through the years, you've been recording music, right? Oh, yes. And I'd like to know. Okay, you're also known as a craftsman and a person who makes bamboo flutes, and actually you make a lot of things out of bamboo. Yes. Right. So when did that start? Or so did you do the music first and then become a craftsman, or were you always crafting? Um, the craft part started really early because in Jamaica at that time. Many young people made their own toys. Um, I grew up in a culture where um, we made trucks, we made our own scooters, we made our own kites, we made slingshots, bow and arrows, catapult guns, um, you name it. Anything that you really wanted, basically, you fashioned yourself. Um, they, we did not have a lot of bought toys. Uh, my mm -hmm. grandmother was always showing you the pitfalls of buying one of those toys that she said, after you wheel it a couple times, the wheel will come off and make yeah. your own. Exactly. <laughs> and so, so you, think, you think kids nowadays should probably uh, construct their own toys, right? Absolutely. Well, I mean, why they, should you spend $100 they, they, on the toy? They can build computers. They can build. I mean, whatever it is that's out here, you can build it yourself. I mean, you know, people have been doing that. In fact, you know, when you look at at Robert Moog uh, or any of the inventors that we have, mm -hmm. people start out. They sometimes start out, and nowadays you don't have to build everything from scratch. You can get kits. And so on, but the whole idea of constructing something that you utilize is a good idea. It teaches, uh, you know, self-reliance. Uh, we have this talk about self-esteem, feeling good about yourself, and being productive, and being analytical, and being creative, and and being able to solve problems and 
be able to and being imaginative to be able to see something and to transform it. It might not be ideal. We used to go around when we were building our things. We didn't have access to just always have new nails. So we would go around and scout out a, a work site where the workmen have bent a nail and they, they don't fix it. And we took those bent nails, straightened them out, and you learn how to hammer that nail without bending it. I mean, there are all sorts of skills and, and uh, lessons to be learned when you build your own things. And so I think that it's a good idea, uh, a sense of valuing mm -hmm. the things that you have. There's a greater sense of value when you make something. Now, and, kids, and you know what's funny because these some of these expensive progressive schools are teaching uh, or, or rather allowing children to think of their own um, ideas and to build based on what they've come up with. And it's yes. kind of almost like going back where yeah, well, well, it's it's going forward, as I always say, going forward to to being a well-rounded individual. Because I think we have we have some misconceptions about education and about what it is and where you get it. And so there's, I think, there's a too much reliance on an institution to be everything. And people, you know, oh, he has a degree from da da da, as though that that's not enough. It's not enough in terms of education. It doesn't mean that you're well rounded. It doesn't mean that you have morals. It definitely doesn't mean you're well rounded. That's for sure. <laughs> you know, well, it doesn't mean that you have, uh, you know, you have ethics either. You know, because we see people that you know have a thousand degrees. They're very you know, um, dishonest and so on. So we have to recognize those, that those are just parts of an education. Sure. But to, to, to be rounded, I think it starts early and that you expose your children to things and that you don't buy everything for them, that you do say to them, you know, I think you could make something for you. Exactly. exactly. Or that you could repair something. And That's another thing too. Um, we're, I mean, people are being taught nowadays to just throw out something if it doesn't work. The first, you know, what I mean, as soon as it goes bad or something happens to it, you just throw it away and buy something new. Well, and the, back in the day, you put a, you jam a stick in it or yeah. turn or get in there and turn something or do something to make it to get a few more years out of it. Well, I remember. Yeah. The, the TV we were, that we used to call our our new TV yes. um, worked because we had a we we had cut a, a, like, a, like a sliver a sliver of uh, I think bamboo or something and we slipped it up into the controls of the TV so we could work and we yes. got maybe five six seven more years out of it. Uh, look, you you know, um, being creative and and uh, and not being so bent on. I, I call it false affluence. We now have a culture in which false affluence is, is very pervasive, um, where everybody wants to show that they're, they're affluent. <laughs> and uh, in fact, um, is, is that really? Do you think that's really important? I mean, why I think, do you, what, what do you think, think motivates people to pretend that they're affluent when they're not? Because, because. Um, because they value being rich more than being creative. <laughs> and so, and there's this idea that, you know, well, I can afford it. I mean, people, well, let me give you another, maybe a more pragmatic example. Okay. People that work downtown, work in an office, many of them will not spend the time to make a lunch and take it with them. They'll buy a lunch every day for a year. Now, if they were thinking like my mother was, they would prepare their own food. They would know what they were eating in terms of it being hygienically prepared. And they would also have a healthier thing. It would cost them at maybe a third of what it would cost that, to have. To yeah. eat. So you could then put that money away towards maybe buying a house or 
you know, that kind of practical thinking. Very so practical. instead of that, yeah. it's mm -hmm. like I go to, you know, you go to a different place and you eat every day. I'm not saying you couldn't do that periodically, but if you're thinking uh, economically as somebody that's not earning a lot of money, sure. that here's one way that you can conserve and being smart about how you have your money. My mother took her lunch uh, with her for all the years she worked. Even when she got to the point where she could afford to buy a lunch, she took her lunch with her and she might buy a drink um, wherever she is. But I think she she even took that with her. So well, my, was, my dad didn't make a lot of money, but he, he, he wore a suit and he had a briefcase. Yes. And if you tiptoed over while he wasn't watching, and opened his briefcase, he would see, you know, his papers, you know, for work, his Walkman, and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. All right. Every day. Yeah. Well, it's not peanut butter and jelly, it's sometimes bologna. But, yeah. like I said, he didn't make a lot of money, and my folks really could stretch a dollar. That's one way they did it. And I still do the same. I mean, I, I believe if you if you make your, it's, it's much, it's quicker. And, well, it's not always quicker, but it is cheaper to make your own meals. It's, it's quicker. It, it, Sometimes it's, it's quicker. It depends on what it, it is. It's healthier for you. you. You have control over what I'm saying. What I'm thinking about is not just that, but I'm thinking about how people get themselves into debt because mm -hmm. they're not mm -hmm. thinking economically. They're not thinking wisely economically, and okay. that. You know, instead of buying um, a Lexus, that you buy a, to a Corolla, and you let the you let the Lexus you use the Lexus money to pay down on the house. In fact, people at there one time would first buy a house before they bought a car. They would take public transportation. They'd get up earlier. They'd do those things, and they'd put that money. They'd invest in a house. Yeah. Now people buy a car first because they got to show. Everybody, they making money, and so that's what I meant by false affluence. And then the people mm -hmm. that are affluent, it's another sense of false affluence when you squander because the earth's resources doesn't belong to you. <laughs> you know, but we don't think that way, and we feel like, oh, I can pay for it. You know, it's almost, um, you know, as though somebody feels like they could, they could they could do something wrong to you and get away with it because they can pay for it. They can, yeah. <laughs> you know, they can hire a team of lawyers, but the, what I'm... And get whatever they want, yeah. Yes, so, so, so I, you know, it's abuse of resources. It's abuse of, of thought in terms of you not thinking about people that have less than you, won't be able to afford maybe to send one of their children to school and instead of you having three cars you could cut one away and help uh, several families maybe send some people to school but I'm just yeah. thinking of that as the wider thought and why I feel that there is false affluence amongst mm -hmm. us at every level and part of that is when we when people buy their children everything that they want and you, you see how they even treat the the items that they have they throw it around there's there's this idea that my folks can buy another one and so they don't care and mm -hmm. and there's that attitude with clothing with shoes with, mm -hmm. you know um, a, an abuse of abundance and yeah. instead of thinking that you know something if, if I put away a dollar each week and then, I, you know, we could send this to some place where, right here in the U.S., where people are struggling uh, either to clothe their children or to send them to school or help a, a somebody on fixed income have a nice day out or just that sort of thought. And so I think it comes into play in how, in how your parent, what your parents give you in what your responsibilities are in terms of taking care of those items. I took a book recently, I did a workshop and I took a number of books to show some iconic 
representation of various cultures so that they, the children could pull from the, some of these symbols for their um, their art project. And before I knew it, the pages were coming out of the book. And when I saw how the kids were handling the book, I was just astounded that they didn't know how to pick up how to pick up a book. They were holding uh -huh. it by the page and that yeah. sort of thing. So I'm just saying wow. there there's a lot that we can teach um, our children just in the most simple ways and it goes a far way. Um, and then the idea that something doesn't belong to you and there's a certain kind of care you know when I lend people my books now I put them in an envelope because I've gotten books back from people where things have been spilt on it or oh. you know this is dog haired or and so it makes you oh, not man. want to There's no respect no yes respect. but I think I think it's a lack of understanding and a lack of training because if you were trained in the right way then you have a different notion when I borrow something from somebody I'm ten times as careful with it as sure. Um, sure. when it's my own. I mean, and you still take care of your own, but you, you, you go into overdrive when it belongs to somebody else because you don't want it damaged. Exactly. Well, Douglas Ewart, I am dying for people to see the flutes that you were showing me before the show aired. So well, I have a... Can you show us one of your gorgeous... Gorgeous flutes. Well, this is one of my pride and joys. I made this back in the 70s. Uh, it's called Bright Moments, and it's dedicated to a, a great composer and musicians. And I really don't use genre uh, in describing anything that I do. Uh, this is Rassan Roland Kirk. Um, he wrote, he was a blind musician from Ohio. And um, incredible. He, he became blind at a very early age and uh, but just an incredible musician and somebody that pulled from every reservoir of sound that exists out there. A consummate artist. And, he, and so he has this, this, this composition called Bright Moments and he talks about what bright moments are, you know, being with your friend, being with your family, being with your lover, so on. And so this flute is actually two in one. I'll give you a little sample. <laughs> And then it has a palm tree. in one, the bass flute on this side, and then what I call a palm flute on the shorter side of, of Palm the, flute. Never heard that phrase. Can you hold that up so we can see the designs? Oh, it, can you see it this way? Yeah. Yeah, these are, these are wood-burned and carved out areas that are painted and 
you know, I used a hand file to make all these carvings. And then uh, at the time, I have a much more sophisticated burning tool now. But I had very simple tool then. One you used to get, they used to have these that would come out around Christmas time. And you could buy them for, I think, $9 or something like that. I mean, it was a relatively inexpensive tool. Again, uh, my emphasis is, you know, creativity is the key. And use what you have. I think that was another force and concept that was de delivered to us as children very early was, you know, we have this saying about red eye. It really means not to covet, not to be covetous. And because my grandmother would always caution you, like when you saw somebody, you were like, oh, so-and-so have a car. And she mm -hmm. say, well, don't covet. And you don't know what those people did to get that. <laughs> so there was, there was always oh. cautioning you about, you know, <laughs> about oh, wanting something just because you saw it or, you know, thought it was all that. Um, but if, if I can ask just a, uh, one more question about your, your bamboo flute there. How, how do you make the holes? Because bam, with bamboo being round, how do you, how do you get a hole in there? You can't. You can't drill a hole, can you? Oh, yeah, you can drill a hole. But before I drilled holes, before I had a drill, I burnt my holes in. Wow. How did and you do that? Then I'd file them. You'd, you'd, you know, I walk through the alleys. You pick up some great stuff in the alley. I'm still an alley picker to this day. <laughs> really? wow. I ride, and sometimes we're going somewhere. I'm all dressed up, and I'll get out and get something, and... Dennis will say, you got on your clean clothes, and rah, 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 rah. I'm like, hey, you know, you know what bought these clothes? Picking up junk like that. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I'd pick up different size steel rods and um, fashion some kind of handle, put them on my mother's stove, and that's how it started, really, in her kitchen. Oh, and so it's with heat. So you make the, so you heat up the rod, and then... Yeah, till it's red hot, you mark off the... You, you just places, and then you burn through the bamboo. Um, of so course. How do you how do you know where the holes go? Because the notes on, depend on where the holes are. Uh, it depends on the width of the bamboo and the length of the bamboo tube, and that kind of ratioing is how you come to where the holes should be. And then you play around with the size of the holes because. The various sizes, some of the finger holes um, vary in terms of size in order to get a tuned instrument. And so I have different size rods or, uh, you know, you use your calipers. I never had calipers and all of that kind of thing yeah. till, till much later down the line. When I was building initially, you were, you were, you were using, you were building your own tools. Sure. Sure. And uh, and there's something great about doing that because I still, you, even now with many different size drill bits and so on, sometimes the nature of the bamboo, the thinness of the bamboo, mm -hmm. it's better to burn the hole because it's less likely to fracture. And so, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and sometimes even after you've drilled the hole, if you want to widen the hole, for example, you heat up that tube and push it in there a little bit or that solid piece of, of metal and put it in there and it, it makes for a more rounded area and then you can use sandpaper to remove you know that the charcoal area the part that's become coal oh yeah of, right right yeah, you can do you can yeah. remove that and then sometimes you don't want to remove that um, but being I'll give you another example of making your own tools. Okay. When I, I was doing leather things, in fact, that's one of the ways we became really acquainted was I built a, a leather, a handmade guitar case for you. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here it is. You still have it? Yes. It's, it's gorgeous. Time for... I wish I could hold it up. Okay, wait. <laughs> no, we're seeing it pretty well. Wait a minute. Here we go. 
Wow. Gorgeous. Oh, oh yeah. Patricia, you've kept that in immaculate condition, girl. Well, it's a Douglas Hewitt original. <laughs> Got the zipper here for my music book and That's little, all and stitching. All and you you punched each hole with an awl. Yes. And then drag the needle with the some kind of string. Wax um, linen. Wax linen. Okay, yeah, wax linen. And yeah, then the handle, dope. I remember when you made the handle, it's it's a piece of rope. Yeah, there's a piece of rope inside of of, uh, of leather. Of leather, yes. Yeah, see? Yeah. This yeah. piece of rope. Wow. So. Gorgeous. Incredible. Oh, yeah. You, but, know, I, you know I wasn't going to let this go. <laughs> well, well. In fact, it's, it's art itself. I mean, it's a shame to put a guitar in there to carry it around because oh, no, the case but, itself is art, in my opinion. Yeah, well, that's... Um, you know, in wanting to to be an artist and to be independent, one has to develop some skills to survive, to be able to get money. And sometimes playing is not enough to to grant you that. So, having gone to a a, a vocational school provided me a good foundation. I was you know, and I, I had a, a well-rounded education, and then on top of it, I had a skill that was very marketable. marketable. It's still very marketable, mm -hmm. and it's transformable in the sense that you can, um, you know, I was able to work on almost any kind of material, bringing it to, that sewing is applicable. And, and it's, it's transferable because as an educator, you get to let young people see how important it is to have these skills. You know, I make I make cases for my I make cases for my instruments. I make some of my own costumes. Uh, you also have a better idea when you look at things that you're about to purchase. How well they're constructed based on your experience of constructing things. So it makes you That's a better smart. consumer. That's really smart. Yeah, it makes you a better consumer. It makes you um, a great, I think, better observer. I think, and it also gives you greater appreciation for things that are made and for property and and all. That. You just have a greater respect when you make things. Uh, you have a greater respect for things that you see that have been made, and you know what goes into doing something. And I think you just value things in a in a different way, and so I think that's an important. And also, um, you get to know or be able to figure out when you're overspending, when you're buying something that's that's commercially made. Exactly, exactly. And you realize I don't need to do that, and I can I could go to a you know and shop around and say you better shop around. You know that song. <laughs> yeah. But you know I build um, really what I consider unsophisticated but functional. Uh, bookcases. Yes. And that's because I have a lot of books, I have a lot of stuff, and bookcases cost to me a mint. I just can't afford to just run out and buy one. I found yes. it much easier to purchase the wood from one of those, um, you know, home, what do you call those places, those big box stores. Yes. Uh, get some wood and learn how to make them yourself. You know? Absolutely. Well, you know, speaking of that, we have, and I'm just going to kind of twist my, twist you around there. You can see that case. I don't know Beautiful. if you can see that bookcase. And there's another one over this way made of crates and blocks. Mm -hmm. And Beautiful. the thing that, the thing, you know, th that concept really goes back. I've been making shelves like this since the 60s. What I love about it is, it's very sturdy. You can put any size book on it. it um, and, you know, the lumber that you utilize to make it, you know, uh, makes it strong. And then if you have to move, it's not down furniture. You can pull exactly. it apart and, and, and you still have every aspect of it. And almost every crevice of it is the area that you can store things in. 
and then you can paint it whatever color you want and so on. So again, using ingenuity, you don't have to go out anywhere and buy. In fact, people come here and they have real what you might consider fancy stuff and they're like, oh, we wish I had a bookcase like that. Well, you still can have one. <laughs> make it. Yeah, you can make it yourself, you know, and and that attitude I think is really important for all of us, at, but particularly for our young people is, yes, I can, you know, as Sam Davis' book, that's one of the titles of his book, which is, by the way, a great read, and what I think a lot of young people should read to get some inspiration, and not so young people, I think everybody, but I, my emphasis a lot is on the young people because they're the ones that are going to assume um, the responsibilities of taking care of the planet. And I think if we have a, a, a greater idea of self-reliance, of building things, not being a uh, building, uh, let me say, obs building obsolescence is a, is a right. normal part of building things now. Uh, we don't need to do that, you know, because it's a waste. Our earth has finite materials on it. It seems endless the way we treat it, but it's very finite, especially in terms of one of my big um, involvements is water, you know, and how we deal with water and uh, the waste that we do with water and the notion that we have that we can't run, run out of water, especially if we live near the Great Lakes, well, right. I got news for you. They can, they can be drained. Here's well, actually, a, living here in Durham, North Carolina, um, we have had some droughts in the past few years. One recent drought, um, one of our lakes actually totally dried up. Yes. And you could see photographs of the cracked earth where the water was, and being from Chicago, I had never seen anything like that, and never really thought about water before. Never thought of just ever running out of water until well, I moved here and, and saw what happens when you have a drought. Yeah, well, you know the REOC, uh, which actually is, um, you know, I think it was about the third or fourth largest lake in the world, um, although it was a salt lake because it was. That's why they call it. But it's uh, the Ariel Sea. It's now completely landlocked, but it's still fed by streams and so on. It's mm -hmm. about three quarters dried up. Uh, where where is this? This is in Russia. Oh, okay. Yeah, A R A L. I think is how it's spelled. But if you go Ariel Sea, it will pop up, and you can see there. There's a lot of documentaries that have been done on this because you can see big ships that are sitting on the sand. Wow. The, po the, point for wow bringing the, the, point, the point for bringing it up is if we abuse any of our resources, it can, you know, go extinct on us. And these things will go extinct over time, in thousands of years possibly. But we're hastening that in the way we deal with water, how we waste water, how we run water without thinking about it, and uh, because we feel like, oh, I can pay for it. I can. You just pay your bill, and you just expect it to be there, and you don't worry about it, you don't think about it. Yeah, it's a, it's a, serious, uh, it's a serious thing. I'll play another little flute for you. This is a sure. transverse flute, as the other one was a transverse flute, and I have another one. Before I play that one, let me play this one. Okay. This is um this is based on Ooh. this is an end blown flute. I made this around the time I met you, you know, around nineteen eighty. Can can you before you can you hold it up so we can see it? Yeah. It's it's about three three and a half feet, about two inches in diameter. Um, it's made from a beautiful piece of bamboo from Jamaica, and what was interesting was this piece of bamboo was infested by 
these little beetles that invade bamboo. And I was just intent on on having this piece. So it's treated with some things that might not be so wonderful, but got rid of the bugs over time. Is, is that the natural color? It's a beautiful brown. Um, some of the, the coloring has been influenced by the different oils I've had to pour on it, but Ooh. it did have an interesting coloration even before I did that. And part of that coloration is based on where it was in the in the stand of bamboo, you know, the way the light was hitting it and so oh, on. Okay. okay. Yeah. Where the sun was getting, how the sun was getting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll just give you a little. getting warmer and beginning to respond more but this is the end blown flute nothing inside of it it's completely open I've painted the inside with a special kind of paint uh, it's painted red and you have to put the instrument against the bottom chin and then Try figure out your embouchure. You know how to blow into it, because um, this is the edge you're playing against uh -huh, here. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It's an end. It's, it's called the end blown flute. It's, it's. I'm not putting it into my mouth. I'm mm -hmm. putting it against my mouth. So it's not played like a recorder, although it might look like that. With a recorder, oh, you yeah. put it into your mouth, and the recorder has a fipple. There's no fipple here. You have to create the edge. I'm blowing across an inlaid piece of um, ebony, is what I wow. have. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Um, so your flutes is, is different. I mean, no two are the same, right? No. Well, there's some that are tuned, um, you know, in certain keys. But even so, they still have their, their personalities, so to speak. This is a smaller, more... Um, more in the range of a piccolo. Alive. So this is this is one of my favorite. I've made thousands of flutes. This is one of my favorite ones, and I had one. This one is in C, and I had one in B flat, but somebody decided. How do you, how do you determine the the notes? Because it's a piece of bamboo. So how do you 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 actually say I'm going to make a B flat flute? 
Yeah, yeah. You, can, you can do that. There are certain aspects of measurement that can take place. Wow. Um, and then, you know, you apply your, your, ex, your experience with working with the wood and the thickness of it and the distance of the holes. And, you know, you fine tune it. You, you know, you, you fool around with it for a while. It's it's just like building any any item. There is some science and some art that goes into making almost everything we do. If you, if you bake and you don't do any experiments, you become a pretty boring baker. And I can imagine. Yeah. you know the same thing with making instruments. You try things and um, and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, and you mm -hmm. keep uh, that part, the parts of it that work. The understanding the size of things, you know, it's it's just like any skill. The more you sure. do it, the better you become at it. The better your understanding of it uh, gets, and so on. But again, you know, I started out. I didn't have anybody to show me. I just went into experimenting, and I think you know some things. Some of us almost come here innately for you and making instruments was definitely one of those things for me. Mm -hmm. But ap applying yourself and doing the work, doing, doing a, making a lot of it if that's what it is or whatever the endeavor is, mm -hmm. is pursuing it, working on it, developing uh, your skill uh, and having others when I made things for myself other people became interested in it and as a result my craftsmanship went up because then the demands that people make when you make things for them and, and you're making as, something that has your name on it or represents exactly. you, you want to do a really exactly. good job absolutely yeah. and you can see this one again wood burning uh, Tools, um, they call it pyrographics now, <laughs> and you can get very sophisticated tools, which I have now. But before, I just use a simple tool, and you know, I, it's hard to tell in some of the things that I've made whether it was the really expensive tool or the or the less expensive one that I utilize. I think the whole thing is 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 doing the work. Mm -hmm. sometimes. Can, can you hold it up a little higher so we can see it? Yeah. How's that? Can you see it? Oh, I see. Yeah. And to um, because there was no node here, there's a piece of cork inside of here, and it actually helps me because when I was tuning it, I was able to push the cork in further or push it out to allow me to fine tune some of the notes. And then it's bound with nylon cord and fishing line because bamboo tends to crack um, in environments that, where there is not enough moisture. So if you have bamboo and it's cracking often, uh, it's because there's a lack of moisture. And if you, you take a feather or something else and oil the inside of it mm -hmm. and oil the outside, I use olive oil. Uh, oh, so you can oil the inside too. Yes, and you know you don't dunk it. You know you just do a little bit, let it get absorbed, wipe the excess mm -hmm. out. You might, um, you know, so get I a. Can, I can see that on the ends, but what about the middle part? You know, you know, I have the, the middle and then the joints. Oh, I have I have the area blocked here. But for example, we do longer pieces. Yeah. Bamboo, bamboo comes with a node, a node, you might be able to see the node, there's a node at the end, it's blocked. If you okay. had a, I was using the wrong word, but yeah. No. Yeah, well, you know, joint, you know, people call it a joint, the node is at the joint, the node is that little piece growing, a, mm -hmm. a, a membrane that grows across in the bamboo and kind of sections it off. Wherever right. you see that ridge on the outside, there's a corresponding node growing on the inside that blocks blocks it from being a completely opened tube. But you, I have tools that I can use to go in and knock out those nodes, burn them out or drill them out or 
file them out after I've knocked them out and they're rough. But this is a natural node. So I was able to tune this instrument without, um, by, you know, having a natural node there. But let's say I had this piece of bamboo and there was no, ant, no block and I wanted to make pan pipes, then I could get some cork, like I use old wine, um, wine bottle corks. I just pare them down and I'll put them in there. So another way to cycle things, you know, instead of throwing... You're, you're a clever man. You figured that out yourself or you read about it in a book or something? <laughs> you figured that out, right? Yeah, you know, you're around, you try different things, you'll try a piece of wood, you know, cork is good, it lasts a long time. If you want to remove it, you can push it out. Mm -hmm. If you want it to stay there, you can glue it in. It's inexpensive. You can accu uh, accumulate them by asking people to save corks for you mm -hmm. if you don't drink wine or if you don't have a lot of cork available to you and you should need it. I mean, you know, uh, you know being, being thoughtful, being creative. You know, we were talking about this is this is a cap that I've made from leather. Uh, there's a piece of um, sponge on the inside, and it's all hand sewn, hand haul, hand sewn. And this is, you know, we're going back 1980, 81. I made that cover, and it it put it slips over the top of the flute to prevent this blowing edge from being damaged. Nice. And then I have a beautiful leather case that this fits into. I'll get the case to show you. Okay. Because if you made a case like this for somebody, it would be hundreds of dollars. Okay. You know, this is this is all hand sewn, and it fits around and laces up. Uh, instead of using a zipper that would break. This, this is tied, so there's no zipper involved. Um, and then I took, um, I took railroad spikes. Got railroad spikes, cut off the spike end till they get a flat surface, okay. and use a, use a file to cut different patterns in that section. Okay. And then I heated them and branded some of these things wow. into How the How on earth do you cut a railroad spike? You, you use a hacksaw okay. and some muscle. <laughs> oh, wow. You know? well, I got a and hacksaw. Then, and, and then you get a, um, you have some files and you can get files that you can cut those grooves into something and then you have a pattern, you have a tool that you can either stamp or you can heat and use as a branding kind of tool. So, um, and, you know, if you, what I did when I needed those spikes was I went to a railroad uh, graveyard and asked the people there if I could get some spikes. And when I showed them what I was doing, they were more than happy to accommodate me. So being, being creative and, and uh, figuring ways to do things, people will help you. I'll give you another example. Here is... It, this this is a beautiful this is a rain stick and it's covered with Japanese fabric and I wanted Japanese fabric I got Japanese fabric in two ways there was some there was a designer working in Japan and I went to her house and she had these beautiful pieces of fabric and they were very, very expensive. And she said, oh, if I tell them what you're doing, they'll give me some samples. And that's how I got these. These are samples of very expensive fabric. How, how are they attached to the bamboo? They are, they, this actually, this is cardboard underneath this. This is cardboard, not bamboo. I do have some rain sticks that are made of bamboo, but this one is not one. It's it's glued on and then it's it's nailed on with brass nails and then it's tied with nylon string here wrapped in at at different intervals 
Well, that's actually on this one. Yeah, there are two areas. And here, this one, then I had strong beads. Instead of cutting off the excess thread and making it looking look very symmetrical, I then save that. And instead of cutting this off, which normally would do, I left the excess out, tied some beads on, and then did this kind of macrame thing at the end. And again, you know, your skill at binding becomes a skill that can become a form of weaving at the end of, of so you make like a tassel here. Absolutely uh, fantastic. Wow. I love those. They sound like the rain. I think in Brazil they call them pão de chuva. This is, and you know, I didn't invent rain sticks. They have a very ancient history, but I'll dare say that you won't find another rain stick that has the duration that mine have, because I've done a, a lot of studying and a lot of design changes to make the duration very long. This is yeah. one of my early rain sticks. And it, it, it rains quite long and with, with, without a lot of prompting. It's covered with, with um, cal old calendar images and postcard images. That's primarily what this is. And this is uh this is rice that's in this one. The first one we listened rice. to. Rice. Oh that's cool. Yeah. The other one has corn in it. Oh wow. Some, some of them have pebbles. Some of them have pieces of glass. I try all sorts of things. Um, I used to have a Brazilian one and I think yeah. it had um seashells in there. Yes. It was yes. real pretty, real pretty. And Absolutely. You, you turn it and let, yeah. let it sound like rain as you tilt it. Yeah. Real nice. Yeah, you, you learn how to manipulate it. It's, that's just one way. You can shake it. You can shake it down. You can shake it horizontally, vertically. So you can you can do that too. You can make mm -hmm. it bump. Uh, use it as a stamping stick as long as you do it completely vertical so you're not bumping it against the edge because sure. you don't want to damage it. But if you bump it and it's straight up and down, it mm -hmm. can take that sort of um, that sort of activity. So Douglas, your yeah. life is so beautiful that you get to do art every day. Yes, I mean, you know, I I, I would this is what I would say. If you have a something that you're truly passionate about, pursue it. And don't be discouraged uh, by anyone or anything. And remember that, you know, one of the, th one of the ways that we decide about our, our future and, and our occupation is how much money we make, bad idea. <laughs> Because yeah. there are a lot of people that have a lot of money and they're very unhappy, so it doesn't bring you happiness. Now, I mean, it you know certainly brings you conveniences, and there's nothing wrong with that. Sure. Uh, but when you're making a big decision like that of a career, and I I would stress to young people, you can do several things well. You know, you you don't have to you you, you don't have to feel like I won't be able to perfect something. You, You'll have these times where you isolate what it is 
your activity is. And I'm not always making things, uh, but I'm making it in my mind. And if I'm not making an instrument, I'm making music. Or if I'm not making music, I'm writing a composition. Or I might be painting, because I paint and I draw, I make masks, I do costumes, I teach. Um, and it's just, it's to, for me, it's not a compartmentalized life. It's, 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 uh, it has, it's a life with a lot of tentacles, but it's coming from the same source. And as long as you're doing things that you're happy with, and it, you're not always going to be able to, even when you do what you want to do, there are challenges, there are times when you have to, you know, um, as they say, suck it in. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you, have to, you have to do that. But um, you can do a number of things and you can do them well, especially if you start early. And don't give up on your art, whatever it is. I always say five minutes a day because people say, oh, I wish I could paint. Oh, I wish I could play. Well, um, you might not have two hours a day. You might not have an hour a day. But let's say you have five minutes a day. And well, while, something's, while something's in the microwave, while you're running your bath water, while you're doing something, you play a song, you make hey, something. Yeah, you know, five minutes a day. If you exercise five minutes a day, it's better than if you're waiting for two hours to exercise. Because, that makes sense. Yeah, because the, the, the practice, and I always use this as one of the greatest analogies. If you're, you're courting the activity that you love, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like friendship. Mm -hmm. if so, you would rather somebody call you maybe once a month and talk to you for a minute, then they call you once a year and they try you try to talk for two hours. Because right. it's harder. Yeah, it's harder to keep up. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just the regularity. It's the it's that touching base. It's the familiarity mm -hmm. that makes mm -hmm. the, the thing really like, wow, I can expect it's Friday. I know Patricia is gonna call me at seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of and the same thing if you have an uncle or an aunt or your parents, you know. Rather than waiting and saying, well, I don't have time till the end of the month, just call him and talk for 30 seconds. Exactly. It's better, you know. And it's, it, the muscle is, is being built. The, the, the continuum, continuum is being maintained. Exactly. And, and so it's just like it's an exercise. If you, it's better to exercise a little bit than if you try to exercise two hours one day a week, five minutes every day, I think would be better. The muscles are more in tune. You aren't putting a strain on there. It's, and then what happens is five minutes, you find a way to get 10 minutes. Yeah. And so if you're a painter, for example, or a poet, and you write a sentence a day, at the end of the week, you got seven. And at the yeah. end of a month, you got at least... 28, if not 30-something. So rather than saying, well, you know, I'm going to wait till I retire. That might be 20 years from now. <laughs> and then you've not been practicing, so you are not, you don't have the flow. Your writing chops are down. You're, you're, not, in, you're not courting. You know, if, you, if somebody calls you up and you don't hear from them and say, well, so, wow, I really like so-and-so, but, oh, man, they call me once every three months, and now they're in town, they want me to come out. Um, it, I talk to so-and-so almost every other day. I'm going out with them because they're my mainstay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, when he, something he goes wrong, can, you know? Yeah, yeah. I feel he, the same way about people practicing yeah. whatever it is that they feel they want to do. Do a little bit at a, every day, and it will accumulate. And mm -hmm. rather than, than, and the same thing goes for if you're saving, you don't have a lot of money. I say this to, to my students all the time. I say you got a penny jar. I say a penny jar. What's that gonna do? 
I say, it adds up. That's what it does. That's what I'm saying. It's the, it's the discipline. It's not the amount. It's the discipline of putting away that money because people be like, oh, it's just pennies. I said, but when the rainy day come, if you have, I used to save uh, in a Quaker Oats box. So I knew when I had it, it was about $50 or something like that. <laughs> and so I just put pennies in there every time. Every night I come home, the rule was you come home, you got a penny, you put it in there. If you got five pennies, you put them all in there. And it, over time, it accumulates. Then after a while, you can start throwing nickels in with it because you get a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember Patricia when I went to bed as a young artist. I knew exactly how much I had in my pocket almost every night. Wow. Right? I'm not rich now, but um, somebody could take money and I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. but then. And and I used to save then. I still mm -hmm. save now. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. but the my point about the saving and the practicing is the practice of saving. Because right. right. there are people that get you hear about people all the time. They get millions and go broke. How do you do that? I don't know. Never well, I think so that, I it's a lack of discipline. Yeah. It's a lack of discipline. Yeah. Because it's not. Douglas, we, we we do have to go. Okay, you do. But, but before we go, can you hold up your newest uh, CD? I know you had, we just said you have new recording. Oh, now, man. Right? Time went that quick. Yeah, I, I know, have a, right? Yeah, yeah I, I thought you just started. What kind of stuff is that? You move up the <laughs> clock on me. This is a CD called Voice Prints. And can you see it now? Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful layout done by one of my students. Jun Park uh, from Korea. He's one of my students at the former students at the Art Institute. It's a recording with uh, Baba master musician Yusef Latif, uh, Roscoe Mitchell, one of my former teachers, now colleagues, uh, Adam Rudolph, a contemporary from Chicago, great percussion player, and myself, Voice Prince. And um, if you go on my website, you can write to me. I don't have this on there yet, but I will in a couple of days. But uh, you can write to me, and, and uh, I can ship copies to you. Okay, Voice and, I'll, and I'll list your email, um, you know, under the, the caption here. For the Fabulous. Show. Fabulous. But thank well, you thank so you. much. And thank, thank you, Douglas. Thanks for listening, and um, it was it was a pleasure. Absolutely. Had a lot of fun talking with you, Douglas Hewitt. <laughs>